How many of y'all want to call them back in and just let them walk out one more time? <laughs> they're so excited. Maybe we should follow them and find out what they're doing on the other side <laughs> over there. Uh, excited about being at church, I hope. And Let's take our Bibles and turn to Genesis chapter number 2. Genesis chapter number 2. And I want to draw your attention to a couple of verses and then we'll look at passage in the next chapter, chapter number 3. I do want to share with you a message on mother. Not my mother, but the subject of being a mother and motherhood. Sometimes we don't do that on special days and other times we do. And I just pray that uh, God will be lifted up and honored and we all would receive some help and instruction today from His Word. Genesis 2, look at verse 21, verses 21 through 25. This is the first time the word mother is used in our Bibles. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Genesis chapter number 3 Just a couple of verses, verses 20 and 21. And Adam called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skin and clothe them. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this Lord's Day, and we thank you for the fact that it is Mother's Day And we thank you, Father, for all the mothers that were able to come to the place of worship today. And I want to thank you for my mother, and Lord, what she has done for me. And Lord, I thank you for the mother of my children, and what a blessing she has been to my life. And and Lord, I just pray that somehow you would help us, that we might come to you and to your word, and have a better understanding, Father. This world has so criticized and corrupted what it means to be a mother. We need you. We need you, God, to speak to us from the Holy Word of God so that we'd have a better sense of what it means uh, to be a a mother. And Lord, I pray that you bless those ladies that have the opportunity, Lord, to raise up children. God, help them to realize what a precious opportunity that is, what a glorious gift. Lord, help them to cherish that gift. Lord, to do their best to bring up children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. So, God, that you might have some mighty servants to send out into the world to do a work that would bring glory to your name. Help us this morning, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. When you think of the word mother in our day and time, it really doesn't have that distinction and honor that it really should hold among people in our our generation. Uh, a lot of people desire to be uh, what one would say a teen. They'd like to have that title, or a prince, or a president, even senator, or a CEO, a count, or a countess. Uh, but But the reality is those titles are nowhere near the title of what mother is, if you think about that just for a little bit. In other words, you're better off to have the title mother than you are to have the title king. You're better off to have the title mother than you are to have the title president. It's more honorable to be a mother than it would to be a CEO, and that doesn't mean that you cannot be both, but just the title of mother far exceeds any other title that you'd find upon the earth. For instance, it it reminds me of the title of pastor. I'm not preaching on preachers today, 
But that has an honorable estate that's kind of lost its honor in our day, hadn't it? Young men used to desire to be a pastor. They wanted to be a, an individual that was used of God. And now they avoid that all, almost altogether because it's kind of a position that's in ill repute in our day. And pastors are no longer honored. And that's our, much of it's our own fault. We must confess that. But a lot of it is also a attack of Satan and of the world. You would be a better off individual if you were called to be a pastor than if you were called to be the president of some country. It, it's a more honorable position. You should desire that kind of position so that you might be used of God in a great way that would bring Him glory. The reason I say that about the title mother is because Genesis 3 and verse 20 reveals to us that Eve is the mother of all living. So without mothers, there would be no kings. Right? Without mothers, there would be no presidents. There would be no CEOs. There would be no living beings that would become anything without mothers. And so that's why it's such a high and honorable estate. God has made it an honorable estate. By the way, the church hasn't reduced the role of women and made them some kind of subservient human beings. In fact, if you really study out what the Bible says about mothers and, uh, and womanhood, you would see that it's one of the most exalted positions in the world. I want you to think about this. A mother and... Mothers create life. Mothers create life. Now, you please give me this, grant me this point because we know without God there is no life. In Psalms 139, the Bible says this about God's creative act in the womb. It says in verse 13, For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. Verse 14 goes on to say, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. Isn't that good? When you think about the formation of a child in a mother's womb and how God is putting that child together, you can't help but to say, praise his name. I know thy works, marvelous are thy works, and my soul knoweth it right well. Verse 15, my substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret. Now, I thank God for sonograms, but uh, without the sonogram, God still knows every little detail what's going on on the inside. Amen? Isn't that good? Nobody else might know what's going on, but... God knows because He is fashioning and forming a human being for His will and for His glory. He said, And curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth, thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect. unperfect. And in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. How precious... Also are thy thoughts unto me, O God. How great is the sum of them. Now, I'd like for you to go back maybe sometime and meditate on that a little bit. He's talking about the birth of just one child, one infant in the mother's room. And God is saying, I am the one that fashioned and created that child. And that's an amazing thing that God does. But he does it in the womb of a mother. Now see, men can't do that, amen? It, that's all, that is unique to motherhood. Only women can do that, no matter what our current society says. Right? There are still only two genders. Amen? Male and female. But this is his design. His design is create, to create life in the womb of a mother. Psalm 71 verse 6 says, By thee have I holden up from the womb, have I been holden up from the womb. Thou art he that took me out of my mother's bowels. My praise shall be continually of thee. 
And so God is chosen in the womb and in the mother's womb to fashion us. God spoke of the great prophet Jeremiah. The reason I want to kind of pause on this a little bit this morning is to think about the fact that you are here specifically, you as a human being, because God made you. That means you're here for a purpose. You're not here as an accident. No matter how you entered in this world, right, uh, through a husband and wife or some other way that you entered in, God brought you forth out of the womb and you're here by His design to do His will, to bring Him glory. And you can do that, amen? And He made you for a purpose. And you see that in Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 5 when he's talking about the great prophet Jeremiah. He says this in verse number 5 in chapter 1 of Jeremiah, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. I, his foreknowledge, knowing everything, that doesn't mean that you were spirit babies somewhere else and he knew you before you came to the earth. That means he is the all-knowing God. And thousands of years ago, like with Jeremiah, before he even came forth, God knew of Jeremiah and he knew of you and I as well. Amen? And we might not have been called to be a prophet like Jeremiah to the nations, but I promise you this, every single one of us have a call of God upon our life. And by the way, if God has not called you to be a prophet, He has called you to some other high priority. Just because you don't have this position doesn't mean that your position is not critical. And ladies, I hate to do this on Mother's Day, but some of you enjoy football. How many mothers like football? All right, then y'all understand it. (laughs) They always want to focus on the quarterback, don't they? Or a running back, right? But without those big, fat, ugly guys up front, that quarterback would be a dud, wouldn't he? He wouldn't be a stud. He wouldn't be an all-star. He has to have a little bit of time to set up and throw, and those that are mostly ignored are the ones that gives him that opportunity, right? They don't get the acclaim as others do, but do they have a vital role? Is it critical what they're doing? Absolutely. And you may not be the quarterback, but I promise you this, what you're doing is vital to God's cause and His kingdom. And if somehow I could help you to see that, I think it would transform the mundane into the miraculous. What you think that you do often that nobody's aware of, God knows He's fully aware of it, and He knows how vital it is, how important it is. And if you weren't getting the job done, uh, the need that would go unmet the need that you're meeting. Amen? So you may not have been called to be a prophet, but God has created you for a purpose. And I would to God that the children would get a hold of this as well. And start thinking not about what I want to do in the future, but why am I here and what is God's will for my life? Think, if you would, even about the birth of God's only begotten Son. Amen? It was His plan before the foundation of the world to send a Savior into the earth to redeem us, to buy us back, to save us from our sins. And that included His birth in the virgin's womb. Amen? Coming forth in the virgin's womb, Mary to be born here, a sin, the sinless Son of God. Isaiah said it this way in Isaiah 7, 14, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. If you ever tempted young people to wonder if Christianity is the true way, is there other ways to get to God, just do a short survey, amen? How many of the prophets that you hear of were virgin born? Only one. (laughs) And that is the Lord Jesus Christ, amen? Amen. No other prophet, quote-unquote, has has the birth that Christ had. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive 
and shall bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. And we know by Matthew the interpretation is God with us. God sent his only begotten son into the world through the womb of the Virgin Mary. Amen? Not through the act of some Roman soldier, not because she was uh, not a chaste young lady, virgin, conceived by the Holy Ghost as she's overshadowed. Now, I'm just trying to remind all of us this morning how important it is. Motherhood is important. Being a mother is critical. And only mothers can produce uh, individuals that will do something great for God. And great people have been born in the earth. And God used sometimes unknown individuals to bring those children forth. So children are a blessing from God. Amen. Somehow I wish I'd get to America to once again embrace that truth. Children are not a burden. Children are not a mistake. Children are not an accident. You know? When me and Brenda, we were, I think it was our third or fourth one of our uncles said to us, have y'all figured out how you're, uh, th th that's happening? I said, we, of course we know how that's happening, but act like, act like it's just an accident. We don't know what in the world's going on. And if you have more than one or two, man, you're just insane. You need to put some kind of stop to that, right? That's because our mindset is, wait a minute, children... You want to bring children in this world? You want to bring children into this economy? You want to really have to raise children in our day? And we forget that children are a blessing from God. Psalm has said this in Psalms 127, verse 3, Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is His reward. Isn't that a good verse? A heritage means a portion, property, inheritance, possession. So children are the property of the Lord, the inheritance of the Lord. In other words, God places little children in your hand and He says, Man, listen, this really belongs to me, but Mama, I want you to care for them, love them, and nurture them, and bring them up to do my will when they get old enough to do my will. And in that what he did with his only begotten son is he entrusted him at the hands of Mary and Joseph and tenderly watched over the Christ child until he was old enough to go forth and do God's great work in the world. When he was an infant, he could not care for himself. A mother took on that responsibility. Amen? So children are the possession or property of the Lord, and you and they are His reward. I don't know if you've ever been around people who can't have children and long to have a child. That's a, one of the most heartbreaking things, isn't it? And then you get around people that act like when they have children, blessed with children, act like they're just an annoyance. And just give them up. And if you've been adopted... Praise the Lord that you had someone that would take you in, amen, and raise you up. But could you imagine having a child and caring so little for that child that you just throw them away and say, whoever can raise them, raise them. I'm telling you, that's, that's, it may be necessary for some to do that. I know there are some situations, but it's not natural. It's not the best. It's not God's plan, is it? The plan is to have a loving mother and father raise those children for God's great glory. So children are not a burden. Now, undisciplined children will drive you crazy. I'll grant you that. Amen? If they're undisciplined, they'll drive you insane. But children are a blessing. Listen to 1 Timothy 5, verse 14. I know this wouldn't be a verse that the... The, the, the people of our day would like too much. But First Timothy 5.14 says, I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversaries to speak repro reproachfully. You see that order? Notice, first marry, then have children. And by the way, that's still God's plan. 
Right? That's what God wants. That's His will. I know sometimes it doesn't happen that way, but His will, His order, His plan is that it goes just like that. I'm glad that if it doesn't happen that way, He's a forgiving and loving God that can forgive us of our sins and help us. Amen? But the best thing is to marry and then have children. And also to, it says to uh, those young women, and you guide the house, and give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. So children are a blessing from the Lord, not a burden. I want to secondly draw your attention to a mother's care because when you get to guiding the house, that's exactly what the inference is. And by, by, by the way, in Genesis chapter 2, it, it says that uh, the children are uh, to be raised. Adam and Eve had, had to, uh, children. And then it says... In verse 24, Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. There comes a time of training, preparation, and then there comes a time when they go on and do the same thing that their parents did. Right. So during that time of training and preparation, that's where we're at the mother's care. Because she wants to train them children well, that when they get old enough to have children themselves, that they can rightly train their children well also. Amen? If we drop the uh, baton somewhere, it's been in that transaction, hadn't it? From one generation to the next, especially in our day, if I'm wrong, you correct me, uh, but now in our day, a lot of grandparents are raising the grandbabies and not mom and dad raising the grandbabies. Isn't that true? And so something has been off for a little season. And we need to try to restore what is best. What's best for the child? To come home and have both mom and dad there. That's what's best. It, can God work in uh, d difficult situations? Hallelujah, He can. Amen? But a mother's care, she's to guide the house. That means managing of the home. Whether that's one child, seven, what was that uh, program used to be on TV, the Duggars? How many they have? Nineteen and counting, was it? <laughs> Nineteen children and counting. Can you imagine that? But whether it's one or seven, my father had a lot of physical problems. He had three back surgeries, he had sugar diabetes, he had several heart surgeries. And there were seven of us in the home, three boys and four girls. And then a, a dad that had a lot of physical difficulties. So my mom had the, had the burden or the load to carry of caring for uh, her husband and also caring for seven Children, and when I was at in the home, I didn't even give it a thought. I gave it no thought whatsoever that Mom had to get up and not just wash my clothes and not just put some breakfast on the table for me, but she had to do it for me and a lot of others as well. Did it ever cross your mind when you were a child how much work was done just to care for you? That's why we need to stop when we get a little bit older, hopefully a little bit wiser, and realize all the sacrifice, all the hard work that mothers have done in their care for us. So since my dad was not able to work, my mother got a job. and She would drive us to school and drop us off, and she would go into the lunchroom and work in the lunchroom while we were in, we were in school. And then when we got out of school, she was off work, and she would take us home from school. That was good for her because she only had to make one trip to the school, but it was awful for some others in our family. I'll leave those names out because when you got in trouble, your mom was there at the school already. But caring for others, if you think about it, God has entrusted those children or whoever into your hand, 
And that is a ministry in itself. That's a noble ministry. That is a ministry that that families are to get behind and encourage. Churches are to encourage. A nation should encourage that ministry. Not the abandonment of that ministry, but that ministry every way we can encourage that ministry. Amen? Because more is done in the quiet moments of at the home when a mother is instructing a child over a question than at any other time in the world. Lessons that are learned that cannot be learned the proper way except in the setting of that home. It's the husband's job to provide for the family. If mom could only work in her home, if mom could only work in her home, it would make it far more easy for mother, wouldn't it? If that's, that's her only responsibility. But we're in a day now where it's almost, we're, we're pushing this, both parents have to work. And I wonder if we are to prayerfully consider backing off of that and saying, wait a minute, that's not the way God laid it out in His Word. It may mean that we have to uh, have to have far less than what we have, and wouldn't that be okay if our children were cared for like God would have us to care for our children, then as to have all the toys that we want? I think we've become such a covetous nation and we don't even realize the, in, the, in, uh, the, the depth of our covetousness, right? Because you go to most of our homes, is this true? The garage is packed full to overflowing. The attics are overflowing. And we also have rental units off the property that are overflowing. And we look around and act like we don't have anything that we need. Isn't that kind of our mindset? Maybe we could cut way back on our mortgage, way back on what our car expense is, way back on some of the luxuries that we like, so that we might be able to help those children be raised the way God wants them to be raised. Amen? Now, I know if you're a single mother, that's nearly impossible. I understand that. And so you need to pray that God would give you grace and wisdom in order that you might raise those children the best of your ability. And by the way, God is well pleased with your best. Amen? If that's all you can do, God is glorified in that. Don't you say that? In Titus chapter 2, listen to verses 4 through 5. It says prior to this that the church's responsibility is for the elder women, those that are more mature in the faith, those that know Christ and walk with Christ, those that have been there and done that. It's their role and responsibility to do this that they may teach the young women to be sober. And that's not to stay away from the bottle. <laughs> Though you ought to do that. Please. <laughs> Don't think I'm saying the opposite of that. You should stay away from the bottle. But that means to be responsible. Stay on task. They're to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children. Have you ever read that and thought, why is that instruction in there? Why do the older godly women have to teach the young women to love their children and to love their husbands? Because we don't really know how to do that. And a lot of times our view of love is, is, is an immature view of what love really is. Isn't that right? And by the way, this is not agape love. If you are interested in the Greek, this is not talking about that sacrificial love, agape love. This is talking about the love that shows affection. This is the love that shows affection toward the husband. And affection toward the children. How many of you have ever been around a parent that did not know how to show affection properly to their children? And so it's our responsibility to try to teach them how to care for their children to show affection toward their husband and toward their children Titus is not his instructions from Paul does not end there 
They're also to be discreet, chaste. That is, they're not. To, they're to be faithful to their husbands, keepers at home, good, obedient to their husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Isn't that a great verse? I've seen children almost drive their mother crazy. Have you ever seen that? Uh, uh, if you haven't, just go to Walmart after church today. Stay there long enough and you're going to see a mother pulling her hair out, screaming at her children as they scream at her or wallowing on the floor. I want this! I want this! No! No! I want this! No! I want this! Okay, here. Take it. Be quiet. <laughs> so guess what happens the next time they go to Walmart? <laughs> He's going to find something else that they want to get, right? So most parents don't know how to properly train children anymore. They don't. They, they treat the child like the child already knows everything that it ought to know. And it knows what's best. And so whatever the child wants, they grant that request. i tell you what that is. That's insanity. They don't know what's best. You do. They need your love, your counsel, your advice, your instruction to guide them in the right direction. We're living in an insane day. If you've got a four-year-old boy that says he thinks he ought to be a girl, you know what he needs? He don't need you to go buy him a dress. He needs you to take him to granddaddy's farm and drop him off. Just let him live with granddaddy for a while. <laughs> Work out in the field and sweat and get dirty and go hunting and play in the mud. And when you get him back, he'll say, Mama, thank you for that. I needed that. <laughs> the most insane thing you could do, though, is to say, okay, if that's what you want. Are you going to do that when he says, I don't want to go to school? He'll say, no, you have to go to school. Well, you have to love them enough to help them, amen? Care for them enough to say, listen, you may be confused now, but I can help you to get past this time. Have you ever confused as a child? Aren't you glad that mom and dad was there to help you in that time of confusion? Part of that caring is, is proper discipline. Proverbs 13 and verse 24 says this, He that spareth the rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes, or chastens him early. You see, if you'll discipline a child a proper way, the right way, when they're young and they're little, when they get 10, 14, and 16, the battles are already won. Amen. And it's a joy. You're not waking up at 1 o'clock in the morning going out and finding the car is missing. Or they are getting a call from the police officers. Would you come down here to the jail? We've arrested your daughter or your son. If you'll do it early and, and correct them and teach them to respond to simple instructions when you say something, you mean it, you're going to be the savior of the rest of their life. You're going to save them from a lot of hurt and heartache and problems if you just love them enough to say, now listen, when I tell you something, I mean it. And you're going to do it. Listen, if they won't listen to you, they will not listen to the police officer. The, the teacher at school, the bus driver on the bus, the guy behind the cash register, they won't even care too much what the judge says. Now usually when they get in front of the judge, they'll show a little bit of respect, but if you notice even now, in that kind of serious situation, they're even losing respect in, in front of the judge and have no fear that he could put more time on their sentence if they would just be polite and nice. Am I still on track this morning? Amen. Well, listen to this passage. You said, Preacher, huh? That chastening seems hard. Listen to Proverbs 3.12. For whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth. So if, if, and he said, now mom, correct your child. And before he said that, let me tell you something. I love you, and I will correct you. 
And if you're a born again child of God, you know God will. Amen? You know He will. You know He says, now listen, I'm going to have to wear you out for that. And that's a fearful thing to think about, isn't it? So if God would discipline us, His children, listen, He's the all-knowing God. Would you grant me that? He knows everything. So He knows what it would be like in 2018, right? And He still said the best way to discipline your children is to wear their backside out. He didn't say time out works best. If he did, he would have put in his word. He would have said, now you put them over in the corner and leave them there for 15 minutes. A lot of times all that does is stir up their inner anger or teach them how to be deceptive. If I sit here long enough and smile, I won't have to sit here 15 minutes. And they know how to start working the system. Do you want, you want them to be obedient or do you want them to learn how to be subtle and deceptive? <coughs> Proverbs 19.18 Chasten thy son while there is hope and let, let not thy soul spare for his crying. In other words, it comes a time when there is no hope, isn't it? Wouldn't you hate to think about that? Here's your child. There's hope here. There's hope. There's opportunity. You can help them. You can reach them. But guess what? There's going to come a time when... It, there's no reason to even try because all hope is gone. Isn't that true? When you think, is, is that what that passage is saying? Can somebody help me here or not? So if you'll chase them when they're early, when there's hope, when they get older, you won't have to worry about all the headaches you're seeing going on in the world today. Amen. Proverbs 22.15 says this, Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. Now, we're not talking about abuse. We're not talking about that. But we are talking about punishment, corporal punishment, that is, that is strong enough and hard enough that they get the point. Amen. You understand what I'm saying? I've seen uh, mamas spank their children before, and the children, they don't cry. They just <laughs> act like they were just being patted, you know? Now, you stop doing that! Have you ever seen that before? Yeah. All right. You understand what I'm saying then, right? I'm not saying beat them over the head with a baseball bat. But I'm saying put it there hard enough that it gets their attention and it may bring a tear or two and they say, oh no, that was a bad mistake. I better not do that again. That hurts. Isn't that the point of it? Spare the rod? You say, preacher, why should I do that? Let me tell you why. You and I are to live by faith. We don't even really know the full intent of what that does, but we know an all-wise God who said that's the way you are to correct your children. And as Christians, we are to say, listen, that's what He said, and so I'm going to faith on Him. I'm going to trust Him. I'm going to say He's the wise one. I'm a fool. He knows what's best. I don't. Let me try to do it God's way and see what happens. And by the way, people that do it God's way, they don't have near the difficulty with their children as a lot of other people. Amen. I know children still have a free will. They still can mess up. But overall, they don't have the problems that many parents have. I, I knew a couple. Uh, they, their marriage was strained, severely strained. The husband would work, and he'd get home, and as soon as he got home to the door, the wife would walk out of the house, and she would say these words, They're yours now. Why? Because all day long they had been driving her insane, crazy. Why? Because she never taught them that no meant no. And stop meant stop. And sit down meant sit down. And come here meant come here. And be quiet meant be quiet. There were seven of us that went to the store with Mom. And we would walk in with Mom, and we wouldn't touch a thing, and we would be with her all the time. She just seemed to spend eternity in the store and we would check out with her, and then we'd go to the car, and we'd help her load the groceries in. And uh, we knew better than to grab something off the shelf. Because her command was, if you get something off the shelf, when you get home, I'm going to get, give you something that you don't want. 
she was a ma if she was a soul winner, she'd have been the best soul winner in the world because she could turn anything around into I'm going to use that to whoop you with it. <laughs> You run out there, run the, around that aisle, and, and with that out of my sight. When I get home, I'm gonna run you. I'm gonna run you around with that belt, and I'm gonna wear you out. It was always something. It was perfect too. I hope you get the point. By the way, carrying levels off. Sometimes you have young children. It seems like, man, this is just. But you know what? It levels off. Look at the Duggars. If you, ever, if, I don't know if you're interested in that, but they have 19 children. Guess what? The older children do. They care for the younger children. So how could they handle 19 kids? Because those uh, older kids are not just sitting down on the couch ordering popcorn for mama, and she's not running around trying to take care of 19 kids anymore. She's got 12 helpers. They cook the meals, and right? And you may not have 19, but that's the goal, right? To get them out of their diapers and off the bottle to where now they're helping. That's a part of caring and nurturing them. Sorry, I got stuck on that point. And then a mother's channel that life. In other words, they direct that life. If you'll notice something interesting in the Kings and Chronicles, you read this comment often. You ever remember reading through the Kings and First Kings, Second Kings, First Chronicles, Second Chronicles? You'll hear something like this: His mother was, and they'll name her. I'm not going to go through mother's names. If you'll read it, you'll understand why. And he walked in the sins of his father. And they'll do it over and over again. This is the king. This was his mother, and he did that which was right in the sight of God. This was the king, this was his mother, and he followed in the sins of his father. Here's his mother, and here's his father. He was an evil man, and he was a good man, over and over again. Why? Because a mother's role is critical in directing, channeling that life, that child's life. She can either encourage him to do great things for God, or she can encourage him to be a rebel and do whatever he wants to and just be a disobedient, evil man. Right? If you go and look at the people in prison now, majority of them that are in prison come from a single family home. They didn't have mom there and dad there. Right? Isn't that true? You need both. You need mom and dad. But listen, that mother has a lot more opportunity, especially if she's in the home with those children, to direct those children to do God's will. John Wesley said he learned more about spiritual things from his mother than he did anybody else in the earth. That should be your goal. Tr traditional motherhood is something that most people don't even have a sense of anymore. Traditional motherhood, right? Children need our guidance. Especially in the day that we're living in, right? Right? When they go to school now, they're, they're, they're encouraging your children to question who they are, their identity. And they need you at the house to really help them to, to settle the issues in their own heart and mind. It's up to you to help that child go the way that God wants them to go. If God wanted your young boy to be a girl, He would have created him a girl. Right? Isn't that right? If he wanted him to be a girl, he would have made him a girl. If he, want, he wanted him to be a man, so he made him a little boy. Now, I'm not saying that to be kind of rude or insensitive. or uh, Please don't misunderstand that statement. I'm just saying God is the one that made them, and he made them exactly the way he wanted them. So what can we do to guide and channel them, Right? Well, dolls, give the girls dolls to play with and doll houses and little tea, tea sets. And put in the hands of boys hammers and toy trucks and BB guns. Right? Girls need pretty little pink dresses, ribbons, and bows in their hair. 
Boys need flannel shirts, jeans, and a buzz cut. Right? Girls need to help mom clean the house and cook meals. Boys need to take the scraps out, put the garbage beside the street. Girls need to be treated tenderly and taught to be feminine. Boys need to be kicked around and roughed up and taught to be masculine. Moms, I know that's difficult, so let Dad do that. He'll do plenty of that. <laughs> let your girls watch Hallmark Channel and romantic stuff. Let your boys watch the Disney Channel where the lions rip apart zebras and eat them up, you know, just that's some high. I know what the world wants you to believe. They want to believe. They tell you this: a woman can do anything a man can do. How many of you heard that? No, they can't. They can do a lot that men can do, but they can't do everything a man can do, right? And guess what? Men can't do everything that women can do. It's impossible. See, we don't have it in us to do what women can do. We don't. You bring us a problem and we say, well, how do we fix it? We don't want to fix it. We've got to fix it. How can we fix it? And the women say, well, let's sit down and talk about it. Just share with me. And tell me what, how you feel. Tell me how you feel. Tell me all about it. Oh, don't you feel better now that you talked about it? Men like, just don't talk about it. Fix it. Fix it. See, God made us differently, right? And when we're together as one, wow! What a team! That child gets everything that child needs. When he falls down and he starts crying, Dad says, get up and brush yourself off. And so he does reluctantly, and Dad walks out of the room and Mom says, come here, sweetheart. <laughs> and he needs both, right? What a wonderful thing to be a mother, to be able to guide a child's life. But what a great responsibility. You're going to either lead those children to Christ or away from Christ. In other words, you're going to either lead them to heaven or you're going to lead them to hell. And it doesn't stop while they're just in the house because they're always watching you. You know what the adult children are doing? They're still watching mom and dad. And they want to see, is mom and dad, are they consistent? Are they going to be faithful? Are they going to stand the test? Are they going to be true? And if mom and dad slips, it gives them enough reason to slip themselves, doesn't it? Amen? Isn't that true? They're always going to, are, are you watching your parents, adults? <laughs> I, I still keep an eye on my uh, mother and father-in-law. I'm still amazed at how godly and consistently they've lived for Christ, and it still makes a great impression on my heart. And if, he, and if they'd ever turn from that, I'm telling you, it would, it would affect me greatly. And so I know the same things about my own children, right? I know they're watching me. And I want to live in such a way that I always point them to Christ. So the first thing you do if you're not saved, you come and give your life to Christ yourself. You can't teach them to go somewhere you've never been yourself. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. And if you are a Christian, please put Christ first. The kids see whether or not we're putting Jesus first, right? Isn't that true? When you're sick, just, oh, you feel so sick, and you, and you just, you know, you just don't feel good at all, you got a fever, and you get out of bed and you go to work, right? Someone said they don't believe in calling in, they believe in crawling in. Right? And you do that and your kids see, wow, dad was sick and he just crawled into work. Work is important. Dad had a little sniffle today. He, was, he looked good, but he had sniffle, and he said, I'm too sick to go to church. Church, it, church is important. And all the while we're telling them all kind of stories like that. Amen? And they're watching and they're still listening and learning. And we're still training. If you're a Christian, follow Christ. 
let people know he's he's so important to me, more important than anything in all the world. I promise you'll never regret that. Amen. Let's stand for prayer.